And so Brooke's my wife, for those of you who don't know it. She speaks in Kai Alpha a lot, so this isn't like, I'm not trying to do this in some unique way, like this is the one time all year she's going to speak with us. That's not the way that it is, so if you're new, don't catch that vibe. That's certainly not the way that it is we lead together. Um, but I just felt led of God to do it this way tonight, and so I hope this will be good for your hearts. I hope that it will be good for hers. And so, here we go. You guys excited about it? Yeah. I'm excited about it. Tonight I get the privilege of introducing the one God is going to use to proclaim his word to us. I already said that, so I'm going to skip it. Tonight, just the way as every time we gather, we should celebrate that we have access to the word of God. Isn't that such good news? Let us not forget that the scriptures are God-breathed and useful for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. Let us not forget that we can't live on bread alone, but rather on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Let us remember that the scriptures can be used to overcome temptation in our lives, just as Jesus used them when he was tempted. Let us not forget that when the scriptures are invested, believed, and lived, that their truths bring transformation to our lives. And let us commit ourselves again not to just hear the word, but also to walk in obedience to the word. Tonight's speaker loves coffee, puppies, sushi, Sunday afternoon naps, seafood, baby goats, Tom Brady, and LeBron James. <laughs> and there is a special place in her heart for those who love these things too. She loves to travel, but is content with being home. She loves to cook, but rarely makes the same meal twice. She prefers to shop and eat local to see what each unique city has to offer. She is the coupon queen and can spot a clearance track from three miles away. <laughs> she is faithful, hospitable, patient, passionate, loyal, forgiving, full of godly wisdom. Can I get an amen? amen. She is one of the most hardworking people that I know and she is full of sacrificial love for God and us. On top of that, she is a friend to many, my wife and my best friend. Tonight's speaker has discipled dozens and dozens of university students, many of which are now intentionally discipling others as well. She graduated from Bible college with a degree in biblical studies and minors in church leadership and music, and she did it early. Although she is qualified educationally, she is a missionary on our team, not by occupation or qualification or proxy by being married to me, but rather through a personal call by God given to her as a young girl. One thing that I'm particularly proud of is that she is a she. Let it sink in. Tonight we are all better because she has decided to be obedient to the call that God has placed on each of us as his children, to go and make disciples of all nations. Tonight she stands and proclaims the word of God unashamed, following Paul's example found in Romans 1.16. Tonight she stands and teaches us what God has taught to her in obedience to Matthew 28.19-20. Tonight she stands as a light set on a stand rather than hidden under a basket in responses to Jesus's, in response to Jesus' word in Matthew 5.15. And tonight she entrusts to reliable men and women the truths that God has entrusted to her with a hope that those reliable men and women will carry it to others in response to 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. We are all better because Brooke is a leader in our lives. I'm really proud of you. And I don't say it nearly enough. So. <laughs> so tonight I just wanted to say it in front of everyone. So would you guys honor Brooke and celebrate her as she comes? Thank you. Whoa, <laughs> I have a lot to live up to. Thanks, I love you a lot. Well, 
I could say a lot about that, but I won't um, because I'll cry. But I feel very honored and I'm very excited to bring the word tonight. Will you guys give me just a second to set myself up? Okay, great. Okay, great. Now we're good. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited. I'm going to jump right in, if that's okay with you. No funny stories, no hee-hawing or whatever, but um, just want to jump right into the word. I'm really excited about um, tonight. I will say this. uh, I was supposed to preach next. Man, this microphone is really great. I just would like to say that, too. I am so grateful that you guys give. You guys bought this microphone. Praise the Lord. Like, you guys give sacrificially all the time. Thank you so much. This is great. I feel so much more confident. Awesome. Um, So I was actually supposed to be speaking next week, not this week, and there ended up being kind of a family emergency situation. Tyler left, and he's like, I just don't know who's going to preach this week. I just don't know what to do. We're just going to have to ask somebody last minute. What are we going to do? Oh, my gosh, all the staff has to get ready. And I was like, why shouldn't I just go this week? And he was like, oh, that's a great idea. So um, anyways, that's what happened. And so uh, I get to be moved from from next week to this week, and I think that God knew it, right? God knew the situation, and I believe that we can take what he wants to speak to us tonight um, to our heart and walk in it, yeah? Awesome. So I need you guys to talk back to me the whole time. It keeps me going, keeps me excited. Amen? Great. So tonight I want to focus on a true story from the Bible. Sometimes we use this word like a story from the Bible, and like it automatically sounds like it's a fairy tale, right? But it's not. It's a true story. I want to talk about a true story from the Bible that I would dare to say that most of you have probably heard before, whether you grew up in church uh, most of your life, whether you've been to church for like today, um, whatever that is, you've probably at least heard of this idea of the feeding of the 5,000. Anybody heard of this story? You've heard of an idea of it. Okay. Um, For those of you who maybe haven't, don't worry. We're going to read it. (laughs) It's really great news. You're going to learn it by the time you leave here. Um, The only problem is that this famous title of this very true life story is very misleading because there were way more than 5,000 people there, and 5,000 is just the number of men present, and it really robs God of of what he does, right? The beginning of the story, we title it of the feeding of the 5,000, but it really is more like the feeding of the 15 to 20,000 people, amen? Like, how much even cooler is that? Like, it's cool that God feeds 5,000. It's even cooler that he feeds like 20 right? So there's this story that we usually would start by saying something like, uh, there were a lot of people and Jesus um, was there with all these people and it was getting late and the disciples told Jesus to send the people away to get something to eat because there was nothing to eat around where they were. No corner stores, no uh, gas station food. Anybody here love gas station food? Tyler Martin loves gas station food. It is the most disgusting thing. Like, I don't understand it, gas station food, but there were no gas stations, Um, No Weigel's, no 7-Eleven. It wasn't there. There was nothing to eat around. And so the way that we would usually tell this story, just to say, the disciples said that they should go, you know, find something to eat somewhere else. They should go home. And, And Jesus says, nope, and then takes a little boy's sack lunch and feeds a ton of people. And while this is a portion of the story, when we tell it without the context of what's actually happening around it, When we tell it without the background, we really lose so much of the character of our Jesus. We miss so much of the character of God that can be seen when we will read the story in context. Everybody say, read the story in context. Let's do that, people, okay? Let's make that a a part of our lives, a part of our study, okay? So when we we read it without the context, sometimes we we really miss how much Jesus cares for us. And so I want us to do that. We're going to look at the story with fresh eyes and with open hearts. So Jesus, we commit this time to you. You are king. You are good. And you are just as good as what we're going to read about in this story. And I pray, Lord, that our hearts would be open. God, that we would be unoffendable. God, in our own uh, flesh. But God, that your gospel would move us to repentance. That your gospel would move us to change. That your truth and your compassion would overflow, God, where we become compassionate as well. And we give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. So we're going to pick up in Matthew 14, but before we 
start in verse 11. I'm going to give you a little bit of the background. I'm giving you about this much of the background, the part that's really, really important for you to know. However, it is a very interesting story, Matthew 14. You should go read it. But basically, the idea is that John the Baptist, anybody ever heard of this guy, John the Baptist? Sometimes, uh, for short, J the B. It's very easy, you know, to just get through that. Um, John the Baptist has been in prison because of basically standing up for righteousness. Um, that's the very short version. And through a series of events, including a crazy lady, crazy lady and her dancing daughter, John the Baptist has been beheaded. He has literally died, honestly, for the sake of standing up for righteousness. And, and he's been beheaded. Um, basically, this little girl or teenage girl, something like that, has gone and danced in front of the king. The king says, you can have whatever you want. She's, she, her mom says, ask for John the Baptist's head on a platter. It's really weird. Go look into it. But the, but the main part of the story is this. That John the Baptist has been beheaded. His head's been brought on a platter to the king. And then we get to verse number 11 of chapter 14. You guys ready to pick up there? Okay, great. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. And then they went and told Jesus. And when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves something to eat. And Jesus replied, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Everyone say you. You give them something to eat. Verse 17. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. And he gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the people, and they all ate, and they were satisfied. Some versions would say that they had their fill. And the disciples picked up 12 baskets full of broken pieces that were left over, and the number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. So I want to look at this passage here this evening holistically, uh, not just about the miracle, but about the compassion, the emotion that is surrounding the moments that we see pictured. For, for you and I, when we think about compassion, we would think of it as being in our hearts, right? There's this idea that we feel compassion, we feel love, we feel emotion in general in our heart, or maybe some of us would even say in our soul. When something moves us, um, we speak using terms like, God spoke to my heart, right? And we would say that you're so soft hearted, right? We would say something like, oh, that hit me right in the heart. This, this thing about compassion, emotion, love, these, these feelings of empathy or sympathy, they're felt where? In our minds, in our heart. But the heart is a muscle that pumps blood. Anybody ever heard of that idea? <laughs> and so it's a very Western mindset to use this word of heart, that our heart is where the feeling and the center of our emotion is. Um, it's very even incorrect to say that Jesus lives in our heart. Um, actually, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, but it's not technically our heart. That is our muscle, right? But as Westerners, we have this idea. And for some of you, you'd say, I'm not a Westerner, and I totally don't think it's in my heart. That's fine. Welcome. I'm so glad. Um, the majority of us would say that we feel with our heart, right? Does this make sense? You guys feel this? But in, in these Western cultures, we'll feel this, but in Eastern culture, in this time of biblical times, the idea of love, emotion, of sympathy, of compassion was actually felt in your, anybody want to take a guess? In your stomach, in your gut. There was this feeling of a churning of a stomach that would happen whenever you felt an emotion. So it didn't hit me right in the heart. It hit me right in the gut. Let's use that word, or stomach. You know what word I hate? I hate the word B-E-L-L-Y or T-U-M-M-Y. I hate those words, okay? So we're going with stomach or gut in the name of Jesus, amen? 
I feel that, right? D don't do it to me. I feel it. I'm feeling the scheming, mostly from these girls right here. No, no scheming. So compassion came because of the kind of like churning in your stomach. And it was not, I got a text message that says, Billy, stop it in the name of Jesus. Okay, I'm getting back. You guys with me? So compassion came because of a kind of churning in your stomach. And it's not the one that after you eat like a cheesy gordita crunch wrap supreme from Taco Bell. That is not the churning of the stomach that was being felt here, right? Though that will give you a stomach churn, am I right? It's the one that leads to pity. It's the one that leads to sympathy. The one that leads to passion. It's the one that beckons us to action. To feel compassion with our heart or with our gut. And this idea of compassion, it's littered throughout this passage of Scripture, and that's really where I want us to spend our time. I want you to turn your lens to compassion. So I'm going to walk through it like this with three points, one, two, three, then I'm going to come back with some sort of application to those exact same three, three points, one, two, three, okay? So number one, what I want you guys to see is this, Jesus was moved by the death of John the Baptist. Jesus was moved by the death of John the Baptist. So John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. Anybody remember this part? It's actually his cousin. There's this story where it talks about where right after Mary learns that she's pregnant, she comes um, to see Elizabeth, her cousin. And it says as soon as Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, it almost seems like she may have been far off, it says that John the Baptist leapt in Elizabeth's womb. That there was this kindred spirit between John the Baptist and Jesus. Um, John the Baptist was the one that, that Scripture would even say was to prepare the way for the Lord. Um, he was the one that was supposed to be, uh, you guys remember this, maybe this passage that says, he's a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. John the Baptist was literally prophesied about to be the one that says, Hey, you guys need to get ready because the Messiah is coming after me. And, and it just so happened that God used his cousin, John the Baptist, to be this person. John even says something like, you, uh, the one who is after me is before me, and I'm not even worthy to undi untie his sandals. John the Baptist is the one that pointed to Jesus as the one to follow. And if you even remember, John the Baptist is the one who baptized Jesus. They were not simply acquaintances. This was a deep, heartfelt connection. This was a dear friend. This was a family member. And you have to think that his death also must have made Jesus realize his impending sacrifice even more realistic. I think of it like this. Jesus must have been thinking something like, John is the one supposed to prepare the way for me. And now he's literally been beheaded. His head brought on a platter to the king, the one who should be ruling, the one who's supposed to bring justice. If this has happened to him, my time is coming so soon. It wouldn't have just been this sort of, of feeling and churning in the gut of I lost my friend, but I'm next. And this is the, uh, is the thing that Jesus is feeling and so it says that Jesus withdrew to a deserted or a solitary place. What we'll know also, though, is that from Mark's gospel, this exact story is told in all four gospels, which is huge. It, like, almost never happens. There's very few stories that happen in all four gospels, but this one does. It must have been really important, yeah, for all of them to write us about it. But from Mark's gospel, what we'll actually find out is that whenever it says that Jesus... Um, got in the boat to go to the solitary place, that actually the disciples must have been with him. Um, and so they, they get in this boat to go to a, a solitary place to mourn and to consider what had happened because John's death moved Jesus. John's death, it curdled the stomach of Jesus, right? And there was this compassion, this sympathy, this angst, this mourning that was happening. Number two, he still saw the crowd through his pain. He still saw the crowd through his pain. Verse 13 and 14, we'll read it again. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. What I just told you is in Mark's gospel, we find out that the disciples must have been with him at this point. 
And hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. So Jesus gets on the boat, trying to get away, trying to go to a solitary place. He lands, and he sees the crowd. And when I think about this in my head, so many times I visualize like two or 300 people. Anybody with me? Like you try to think about stories in the Bible and like the felt board idea comes up in your mind or like little cartoon characters and I forget like it's real. Like I know that it's real, but in my head it never plays out that way. And so I, I think and like I visualize him getting off the boat and he sees like two or 300 people. and He's like, hello, everyone. This is not a good time. <laughs> Glad you're here, though. <laughs> Thanks for following me. I tried to get in the boat to go away. <laughs> But it wasn't like that at all. We know that there were 5,000 men, and so likely over 15 to 20,000 people are there in a deserted place, in a place where there no, no one else is, a place where he thought he was going to be alone. And what I would say is that in one of the most difficult times of Jesus' life so far is where he is. And in the moment, he was saying, I really need some time alone. Has anybody ever, you know, felt grief Like so many of you, you would even say, the last year of my life, I've lost more things, more people. Um, I've experienced a lot of grief. A lot of you would say that. For some of you, you would say, maybe I haven't lost people, but I've just lost my hopes, my dreams, the things that I thought were going to take place. I've lost relationships in my life. And you guys know when, like, grief is fresh, that, like, heart-sinking feeling that you have. See, I went with the heart again. It's really, you know. They wouldn't say with the gut, yeah. But it's like this heart sinking feeling. You know that like bubble in your throat that you feel? And it's kind of like this. If you look at me the wrong way, I'm going to lose it. And then you have the person that's like, oh, what's wrong? Are you okay? Thanks for asking. Everything's fine. Like, you, it's just a lot. You guys feel me, right? This has happened to you. And it's like, this is the hardest moment, and I'm trying to keep it together, and I just don't know if I can. It feels like you simply can't entertain someone. You can't even have a conversation. Or the dreaded question of, like, do you need a hug? And you're like, no, because if you touch me, I will cry. And then I will have to explain my weeping. I will snot on you. And it will not be fun. And there's this feeling right after you go something that feels so, oh, I just need to be alone. I just need to not be touched or to be looked at or I feel like a spectacle. You know, you feel like everyone knows. You feel like everyone's looking at you. Anybody been there? You guys feel what I'm feeling. I want you to put yourself back in that moment and realize that's what Jesus is feeling here. I have just experienced the fact that my dear friend, my cousin, he's died. And not just that, but a very gruesome death. And Jesus just needs a moment alone to process. And instead, he basically rolls up into Thompson Bowling Arena, and it's full. And he is the star of the show. And he has, like, this is not supposed to be the thing. I would say he has no clue, but he's Jesus, so there's that, too. But it doesn't say that he saw them and told them, like, this is not a good time, but I will be back. Bless you. And then just, like, leave. Or you guys know, like, when you're in Walmart and you accidentally, like, see somebody that you know and you're like. (laughs) You, like, keep, you've done this before. Or, like, you're even, like, you're in the vol shop and you're like, don't, I haven't seen them. Or you show up in a class with somebody that you just aren't in the mood to talk to, and you just pretend like, what was that? I'm sorry. Like, you take your headphones out, something like that. You feel that way. And Jesus did nothing of the sort. He did nothing of the sort. It says he saw them, and he had compassion, and he healed. No social distancing, no I'll be back, Nothing of that sort. He had compassion on them. His stomach was churned. His body was impacted. His heart was broken. He had compassion on them, and then he healed their sick. And I would say this, that you can't pray for healing for someone and not have an emotional response. This mo- these moments that he's having with these people is not where he gets to be emotionless, where he gets to just go through the motions. He literally pours out his heart before these people. He had compassion with his gut or his heart, right? And he healed their sick. He believed God. 
He believed the Father. He took it the step farther. He didn't just wave and shake their hands and say, so glad that you're here, bless you, and then like get up and say a couple words and leave. Like He went and he healed their sick. I would say that he probably went to a lot of different people, not just like a blanket statement prayer, because we see that most of the time within Jesus' ministry, right? That he's a one-on-one sort of God, and that's good news for me. It's good news for you, yeah? He didn't just feel compassion. He acted compassionately. And he was moved. Number three, compassion was used as a teaching moment. Compassion was used as a teaching moment. Verse 15. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. And Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. So the disciples say, it's getting late. This is a remote place. No gas stations. And Jesus says to them, you are the one that should give them something to eat. And here's where reading scripture in context matters so much. The disciples are mourning too. It would be very easy to read this passage and to see it as they just don't care, right? Right? Or to see it as they just want the people to be able to eat. Or they just want Jesus to be able to be alone like he seemingly wanted to do, right? But I would also put into play the fact that the disciples are mourning too. Stay with me. Everyone's like, what? How do you know this? What's going on, okay? Many of the disciples were also disciples of John the Baptist. You can find this in John chapter 1. Um, what we know is that John is standing up basically three days in a row. We know that he's, he's saying, look, the Lamb of God that takes away to the sin of the world. Pointing at Tyler, he's not it, but love him. Look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, right? And then he says the, the thing of like, the one that comes after me, I'm not even worthy to unhi- untie his sandals, right? And there were even disciples that were following John, okay? Apostles of John, people that were devoted to him, of learning from him, of him being their teacher, right? And it says they left following John and they went to follow Jesus. We know at least one of these was named, Anybody? Andrew, good job, Andrew, and he then brought his brother named Peter, great job, and there was another mystery disciple, I don't know who the other one is, if there is another, you know, idea out there, you guys can tell me later, but at least Andrew and one other, very minimum, were followers of John the Baptist, had spent this time with him, had been intimate friends, had been close, had been receiving instruction from him, at very least two of the twelve, right, and there could have been more, and we also know that Peter was, was the brother of Andrew, which meant Peter very likely had a lot of access to John the Baptist as well. Um, and so there's this idea of they've left John the Baptist. They're not now following Jesus. And so the grief that Jesus is feeling, the disciples are also feeling at this moment. They've been connected to his ministry just as well. And I also would have to think this, that the disciples had to be thinking, man, I know that Jesus told me that John the Baptist was the one to prepare the way for him. And if this could happen to him, what's going to happen to me? What's next for me? What's next for my future? (laughs) He was beheaded. His head was brought in on a platter. Did you guys hear? It's not just a rumor, but it's real. What will happen to me? And compassion wasn't automatically contagious in this moment. The disciples were mourning too. And the compassion didn't seem to come as easily for them. They needed to be taught how to show compassion. And maybe Jesus also was simply showing compassion and care for them. The passage tells us that no one had enough to eat. And the area was remote. And we know that from another parallel passage that they found the food that they had, the five loaves and the two fish, right, from a little boy's packed lunch. And Jesus didn't simply just take it, bless it, break it, and give it to all 15,000. He said to his disciples, you give them something to eat. 
He said the disciples get to be part of this. Disciples seemingly found this boy with the lunch. And for whatever reason in my head, it's like they just turn around and was like, okay, does anyone have any food? But like you guys have been with your D groups and there's like 10 people in the room and you can't get like one question over the crowd to be like, hey, does anyone have anything to eat? Like, can you imagine 15,000, 20,000 people? It wasn't just a simple turnaround question. Hey, does anyone have anything to eat? Like they had to put work into this idea of going to find someone in the crowd that had something. But we missed that part. We missed that Jesus said, you give them something to eat, but you have to have the faith enough to go around and to ask the individuals who has something. And they come back to Jesus and they say, you're never going to believe what we found it's just five little bitty like rolls and two fish and Jesus is like okay give them to me because there's faith in just the asking right and just the moving because because Jesus wanted the disciples to be part of it that is such good news God wants you to be part of his plan guys I'm gonna talk about that later I'm getting ahead of myself but that's just good news God wants you to be part of his plan. He wants to use you. And I am so grateful for that, right? They had to go seek out the food. They had to come back and tell Jesus. And then Jesus tells them how to organize it. He says, okay, have groups of 50 and have groups of 100 because outreach can have great planning involved in the name of Jesus. And they brought out five small barley loaves and two small fish, and it's the lunch of a poor boy. But little is very much in the hand of God. And they give God what they have, and he takes it, he blesses it, he breaks it, and he gives it away. And so Jesus does just that. He takes it, he blesses it, he breaks it, and he gives it to whom? The 15,000? The 20,000? No. He gives it to the disciples. As if to say, you get to be part of this miracle. You, yes, you are hurting too. And yes, we are mourning. And yes, the unthinkable has just happened. And yes, this could have, this could have just happened to us or it could happen to us next. But for now, this is what we can do. We can serve these. We can love these. We can give to these. We can bless these. And Jesus goes farther. It says the whole crowd ate until they were full. They ate until they were satisfied. And then He doesn't just leave the leftovers with the crowd. He sends the disciples back out to collect the leftovers. Y'all, that is so weird. Have y'all ever thought about that? These people were hungry, and they just now ate their fuel. Aren't they going to have to go back home on a long journey and walk? But he sends the disciples back out to collect the leftovers. Like, I'm sorry, ma'am, um, we don't actually have any boxes here. Um, if you'd like to take it, you could sneak it into your purse. But my manager, he's very observant. He will know. I'm sorry, actually. I do have this basket that I'm supposed to collect the leftovers with. Like, how is that conversation going? Like, excuse me, disciple. I have to go home after this. I'm going to be hungry. And he's like, no, no doggy bags here. I'm sorry. Sorry, guys, no leftovers for the fridge. Like, that is so weird to me. Like, that should puzzle us, right? That should make us question, why? It isn't explicitly written, but I think we can have a few ideas, right? The disciples picked up 12 baskets full of leftovers. Why? Because my God does exceedingly, abundantly, above, more than what we can ever ask or think or imagine. When he does something, when he shows compassion, he does it to overflowing. And that is such good news. Jesus didn't give the second best care to these people because of his pain. He showed up and he gave his absolute best He saw the crowd, and he was moved in his gut with compassion. And he wanted to teach his disciples to be moved with compassion too. And so he let them be part of it. He showed the disciples from the leftovers that they too would be taken care of. That they were important too. And he had compassion on them too. Why 12 baskets left over? I personally think it was so that each disciple could feel the weight of the compassion of Christ in his hand. To feel the abundance of Jesus' love and compassion 
in his hand. To feel the goodness of God on his arm. To walk with the provision of the Messiah in a basket. This is what my God can do. He feeds us all to full, and we have 12 baskets overflowing. And each one of us gets to come back and say, I saw what you did, Jesus. And thanks for letting me be a part of it. That's good, huh? Praise God. So how does this all apply to our life and what changes because of this news? I told you I'd come back around to my three points again, so here we go. Number one, we said that Jesus was moved by the death of John the Baptist. I'll say this, Jesus, this is the application part. Y'all just need to buckle up, okay? In the name of Jesus. Jesus did not go on a self-care retreat as he mourned. He went to be with the Father. Jesus did not go on a self-care retreat as he mourned. He went to be with the Father. There will be things in our lives that we must heal from. Things that will grip our stomachs. Things that will make us sick. Things that will drive us to get in the boat and set off to sea. But if it leads us to look for the answers in ourselves or in others, we are missing it. We are missing how to heal and how to mourn. Jesus went to be with the Father. At the end of all of this passage of Scripture, he's fed everyone. They've brought the baskets back. It it says, verse 22, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get in the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, He went up on a mountainside to pray, sorry, by himself to pray. Later that night, he was alone. When our hearts are broken, we have to run to the Father. He is the only one who can heal us. He is the only one who understands us fully. He is the only one that has has literally created our hearts or our guts. He created that place of feeling, and he is the only one that can make it whole. The only one. We can have great support systems. We can have great friends. There's nothing wrong with that. But if they are not subordinate to the voice of the Spirit of God, I would dare to say that you will never heal from your pain. Ever. Every other voice has to be subordinate to the Spirit of God. I'll also say this. God wants you to mourn. God wants you to heal. God does not want you to live with an open wound your entire life. When you get a big scrape, it doesn't automatically just go to, like, disappearing, right? It doesn't just automatically become, like, it's just a little scar there, right? It first has to scab. And then y'all know it, like, kind of peels off. It's kind of gross, right? And then it bleeds a little bit more, and then it scabs again. And then hopefully you can keep from, like, messing with it again. And then it just gets smaller and smaller, but it takes time. It doesn't just go from gaping wound of bleeding everywhere. Hope you guys don't have queasy stomachs. (laughs) Too bad, so sad to just being healed and having a small scar. It takes time. God wants to heal you. But you cannot heal yourself. Jesus did not go on a self-care retreat as he mourned. He went to be with the Father. Number two was he still saw the crowd through his pain. Flip side, you learn who you really are in the hardest seasons of life. You learn who you really are in the hardest seasons of life. Only God can help us show compassion in the midst of needing compassion. I'll say that one again. Only God can help us in showing compassion in the midst of needing compassion. Have you ever been around someone who's in pain and all they can do is talk about themselves? You guys ever felt that? And it's, it's really difficult because, like, you get it for a little by, a while, but it's, like, three months in, and you're like, oh, my gosh, we never talk about anything else, and I don't know how to help them. I don't know what to do. You almost feel like this helplessness, right? It's because they're not spending that time healing from the Lord, right? They're kind of expecting you to bring healing to them. Good news, like, you can't, and you're not responsible to. You have to continually lead them back to the Father going back. Have you ever been with someone who dwells on their pain and can't read the room to know when others are also hurting? 
sometimes our eyes stay downward because of pain or shame or difficulty, difficulty, or they stay inward, looking only on our own selves. But we have to keep our eyes upward towards God and outwards towards his plan, outward towards others, because we can't miss those that Jesus has called us to love as he has loved us, even when we are in pain, even when we ourselves are in need of compassion. I love Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It says this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If Jesus Christ would have been so worried about his own fate, his own pain, his own sorrow, that his eyes stayed down, we would never have a way back to the Father. But he didn't. His eyes stayed up and outward up towards the Father, outwards towards the needs of others. Not ignoring his own stuff, right? But going to the Father for the one who would heal. You learn who you really are in the hardest seasons of life, and I hope that you will find that you are moved with compassion. I hope that you will find that you will not be self-seeking, but you will go to the Father for that, for that healing and be able to see others in the midst of their pain as well. Amen? Number three, we said compassion was used as a teaching moment. Flip side, compassion isn't always contagious. Compassion isn't always contagious. We have to be Christ-like in teaching others how to show compassion. This one's pretty straightforward. We can't expect everyone to get it. We can't expect everyone to start walking in immediately. We have to model it. For some of you more mature believers, you expect the younger generation to know how to be moved to actions through compassion, but they've never seen it modeled in real life. They've never seen compassion displayed by you, by another believer, by their church maybe. They've never experienced this compassion handed out in some way, tangibly or emotionally or you fill in the blank. And so they don't know how to show this compassion. So we can't knock them. We just have to help them, right? We have to show them. I think it's really cool how Jesus does this for the disciples, right? He literally models it. Compassion comes first through wanting what Jesus wants and next through acting how Jesus would act. When we teach people how to fall in love with Jesus... And then how to want what he wants and act how he acts, compassion will follow. There is no question about it. You will become a more compassionate person, but you can't just expect people to get to that point. We have to help them fall in love with Jesus and then model this idea of compassion. Compassion without action is just observation. Compassion without action is just observation. So I want to close in this way. Somehow, in this TikTok Jesus generation, we have been brainwashed to believe that loving our neighbors as ourselves is still more about ourselves than our neighbors. We have been brainwashed to believe that loving our neighbors as ourselves is still more about ourselves than our neighbors. Somehow we have been blinded with a me-centric gospel and believe that self-care is part of the Beatitudes. Somehow we have highlighted the idea of Jesus taking naps, drinking wine, and going fishing while we ignore that he is on the boat in the middle of a raging storm. He says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And that he says, come follow me and I will make you into fishers of men. The life of Jesus was much more about self-denial than self-care. And until we get this truth inside of us, we will simply be following a false gospel. That's really harsh, but it is true. Does Jesus tell us to love ourselves? Absolutely, as you love your neighbor. Does Jesus love us? Absolutely, We were knit together in our mother's wombs. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. The Bible also says, though, in Jeremiah, that the heart is deceitful above all things, and it is beyond cure. 
Who can understand it? Because we don't make a very good master for our own lives. We can't heal our own selves. Jesus has to do that. Does Jesus tell us to deny ourselves? Yes. He actually says to die to ourselves every day. Galatians 5, 24 and 25 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have been crucified. Sorry, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So do I believe that we should care for our bodies, for our minds, for our spirits? Absolutely. When Jesus is tempted right before his baptism, he goes through intense spiritual attack. I said right before his baptism, but I meant right after. I think I said that wrong. Right after his baptism, he goes through intense spiritual attack. How does he respond with the word? He says man can't live on bread alone, but has to come from every word that comes from the mouth of God. When Jesus experiences grief, like in this passage that we're talking about now, or even with the idea of Lazarus that I've talked about recently, we're just talking about grief whenever I talk. So y'all just need to get prepared. Y'all know I'm about to talk. We're going to talk about grief and hurting and pain, okay? Last time I think I talked about Lazarus, or maybe that was two or three times ago. Who even knows? I remember it. It was good for my heart. We're moving on. When Jesus experiences grief like this passage or with Lazarus, he shows deep emotion. He cries. He mourns. He knows he needs moments alone, but he doesn't do those things at the expense of others. He does them as his eyes are wide open to others. And when Jesus on the cross experiencing torture, he says things like, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He even takes a moment to be sure that his own mother is taken care of. While he's on the cross, be sure that John will take care of him whenever he's gone. Take care of Mary when he's gone. The world tells us that when we are experiencing pain, we look out for us. You do you. You take care of you. When we're hurting, we should lick our wounds alone. When our minds are overwhelmed, you should take a bubble bath or you should go on a run or you should watch your favorite TV show to help ease your pain or ease your mind. And yes, those things may help, but I would dare to say that when we live in these things, in a temporary numbing, we miss seeing Jesus as the way and the truth and the life. Do not be numbed into missing the fact that he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. We also gloss over the fact that even in our pain, the world doesn't just stop. The world is moving forward for others. Can you be bothered to still be moved with compassion even as you are in need of compassion yourself? We're always trying to take care of ourselves, people. We want to comfort ourselves. But that is God's job. It is God's job to take care of you. And he is much better at doing it than you are. We get so busy caring for ourselves because we're worried that no one will ever care for us. Our passion becomes about us. Passion for ourselves and compassion towards others becomes obsolete because our eyes are down and in instead of up and out. You guys with me still? I know this is hard. This is stepping on my toes. It's stepping on y'all's. I'm with you. God cares for us all. In an upside down kingdom, we have to trust that Jesus loves us more than we could ever love ourselves. Jesus' gut is churned for you more than your gut will ever be churned for yourself. Jesus' heart is moved for you more than your heart will ever be moved for your own self. And so I want to leave you to think about this tonight. Do I allow sorrow to make me cynical? Am I mourning in the power of the Spirit or in my own way? Am I mourning by caring for myself or allowing the Father to care for me? Is my heart hard? Do I see needs and run or allow my stomach to be churned? I think we have to say, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. God, show your power in the the midst of my pain and my weakness. God, help me remember that not everything is about me. God, help me remember that you want me to be part of your plan, to love others, to show compassion. And then I would say this, have I taken 
the time to bring along new believers in showing compassion? Am I teaching how to serve and give or just expecting that it will happen? When I see a need, do I go alone to meet it? Or do I allow others in on the experience? Compassion is kingdom business, and I never want to do it alone. Compassion is kingdom business, and I never want to do it alone. As I said earlier, at the end of the passage, Jesus is sure to send off the disciples and to send off the crowd so he can again be alone with the Father. And if you take nothing away from tonight, let it be this. When you spend extravagant time with the Father, when he is the one you run to in the good and in the bad, you will see others the way that he sees them. You will treat others the way that he treats them, and you will teach others to love in the way that he loves. And so I want us to be moved with compassion. Amen? This is how I want us to respond two ways. We are going to take communion together tonight, and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but the first way that I want to ask you to respond is in this way. I want to ask you to respond, but I also want to equip you to leave this room and to respond better in your time, personal time with God. So it's a two for one deal. That's good news. Yeah. I like to use the idea one of our mentors gave us before of like putting handles on something so you can take it out of the room. That's the idea behind tonight. And so what I want you to do is pray through Scripture. Some of you have never done this before. Some of you do this all the time. What I want you to do is I want you to go back to this passage in Matthew 14. And what I want you to do is is start reading through the passage from verse number 11 through verse number, um, I think it's 23 if I'm right. Yeah, verse number 23. What I want you to do is I want you to read verse number 11 and verse number 12. And then I want you to stop and say, okay, what should I pray about that I want God to do in my heart here? Okay, so maybe it's, well, that one's really hard. (laughs) The head brought on the platter. (laughs) Whatever that is for you, okay? God, help me to mourn when other people mourn. Maybe that's the way that you stop and pray there. And you pray about that. Then you As you say amen, you move on and you say, you read 13 and 14, and you stop and say something like, God, I want to know what it's like to withdraw with you in the times of pain that I have, right? And so what we're doing is we're praying through this as we're reading scripture. You're going to have your own time with God for a moment, but I'm literally telling you and equipping you how to spend this time with God. Sometimes I think we say, okay, respond to God, but some of you are like, I don't know what to do. I don't even know what to say. This is a great way to do it. So I want you to go through each verse. We're going to give you just a couple minutes to do this. And I want you to just read read those couple of verses, whatever. Stop and pray about that. Ask God to move in your heart. Ask God to move in your gut. Pray about that. Pick up where you left off. Keep going as you get through the end of it. Does that make sense, everybody? Understands. Okay. Tyler's going to play for a few minutes. We're going to respond. Then I'm going to come back, and we're going to take communion together. Okay?